I want to talk about something from Matthew's gospel, but before we get to that, um, I want to start with some words of Paul. This is from 2 Corinthians chapter 5, beginning in verse 15, and it's a passage that comes to my mind a lot in thinking about um, perspective and how we see people. And uh, let, let me read these words, and here's what Paul wrote. He died for everyone, so that those who receive his new life will no longer live for themselves. Instead, they will live for Christ, who died and was raised for them. So we have stopped evaluating others from a human point of view. The reality of Jesus that Paul is talking about, the ability of Jesus to change lives, and the fact that Jesus keeps pursuing people, those realities, all that together, it makes us see people in a different way, a changed way. And after everything Paul says, in the very next sentence, he says it also changed, or one of the things it also had to change is the way we see Jesus. And that had to take place, and then we begin to see everyone else differently. Um, and having said that, and, and trying to wrestle with that, what does it mean to see everyone in a different way or different from the way we ever saw them before? And having said that, I want to talk about something from Matthew 13, verses 24 through 30, and then verses 36 through 43. And it goes like this. Jesus told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while everyone was sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and went away. When the wheat sprouted and formed heads, then the weeds also appeared. The owner's servants came to him and said, Sir, didn't you sow good seed in your field? Where then did the weeds come from? An enemy did this, he replied. The servants asked him, Did you want us to go and pull them up? No, he answered, because while you are pulling the weeds, you may root up the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. At that time, I will tell the harvesters, first collect the weeds and tie them in bundles to be burned, then gather the wheat and bring it into my barn. Then he left the crowd and went into the house. His disciples came to him and said, Explain to us the parable of the weeds in the field. He answered, The one who sowed the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world, and the good seed stands for the sons of the kingdom. The weeds are the sons of the evil one, and the enemy who sows them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age, and the harvesters are angels. As the weeds are pulled up and burned in the fire, so it will be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send out his angels, and they will weed out his kingdom, everything that causes sin, and all who do evil. They will throw them into the fiery furnace, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. He who has ears, let him hear. Jesus is talking about something they understood. We need a little bit of explanation here, but it would have been very clear to them. They called the weeds tares. Um, we call it something different. That plant is known to us. We called it bearded darnel, and it is not a good plant to have around. It looks like wheat. It is very similar to wheat. It is very difficult to tell the difference Really, up to the point that it bears seed, it looks almost identical to wheat. But the seeds that come from bearded darnel, they can cause all kinds of problems, and in fact, can, that can lead to hallucinations and even death. So it, it's, it's a scary plant. It has some very aggressive roots, too. They tend to surround the roots of the wheat plants, and then they can suck up the water and the nutrients that try to get to the wheat. They go into the darnel instead. So, they, so that that good stuff just doesn't make it to the real wheat. And it has stronger roots, too. The problem is then, because of its stronger roots, when you try to pull this up, the wheat with its weaker roots tends to come up with it. It is really, really nasty stuff. And in talking to an agricultural farming kind of people, it is a very good allegory for evil because, hey, in a farming world, it was evil. So... That is something they understood. 
this is a reality that's familiar to them, but the way that Jesus tells this, the way the story transpires in this parable, it's a little bit of a variance from what they would have expected, from what would have been normal. In this illustration, the owner of the field <clears throat> sows the seed rather than sending out the servants to do so. That would not be the norm. Also, it's made very clear in the parable, this is not about a naturally occurring weed that some of it just happens to get into the crop. This is about an adversary, an enemy, who is intentionally trying to mess up the growth of the good seed. So uh, the instructions that are given here are a little bit different too. Normally, in the wheat growing of the day, there, it was normal to have a little bit of this stuff. It wasn't that unusual. And what they would do is several times in the course of the growing of the wheat in a field, the servants would be sent out into the field to try to get out as many of the weeds as they could, hopefully doing as little damage as possible. Yeah, they would lose a little bit of wheat, but getting the, the um, weeds out was just part of the process. But in a kingdom parable, Jesus goes a little bit against what they're used to. Now understand, this is only found in the Gospel of Matthew. And, and here is Matthew writing a few years later, actually quite a few years later, to a church and trying to understand what their church should look like and trying to figure out how to deal with some of the struggles that would come up in the church between people. So here's Matthew choosing to sh share a unique teaching moment from the ministry of Jesus, something that Jesus taught but also something that Matthew uniquely believes the church really needs to hear. So Jesus, he gives the parable, and Matthew tells us a little bit later, he gives the disciples an interpretation. And there are reasons that this parable, this allegory of the kingdom of heaven, goes against some of what was normal for the wheat farming of the day. Okay, let's walk through that. The Son of Man sows the good seed we get that the message of jesus is good seed it takes root in human hearts and it works miracles of faith it changes lives it heals relationships it builds faith communities all of that is so important and that is all what the message of jesus is about but sometimes in the wheat field that is the faith community Things don't always go smoothly. People don't always agree. We can have, even in the church, differing opinions, and we can, if we're honest, have radically different ideas. Sometimes there is conflict. Sometimes there is disagreement. So what do we do? And, and also, one of the things we have to pull from this parable is the question of, what do we not do? The parable of Jesus here says that, first of all, we have to do things in a different way. We need to be really slow to decide that we get to weed God's field. We could be very wrong about who is wheat and who is weed, so we don't need to be the ones who do the labeling. If we weed on our own initiative, we can be very liable to hurt some people and we start losing wheat with the weeds. And I think a lot of us have seen really good and just wonderful people leave churches because someone wasn't treated well or someone wasn't accepted or someone might have been labeled in an unkind way. So here's Jesus. Jesus sows the good seed. That's his job. His message is still good seed. And there are still, though, struggles and conflicts in groups of people, churches included, and sometimes they're not very easy to deal with. But the assurance here is that the servants of Jesus are not intended to be the ones who weed the field, and they're also not intended to be, intended to be the ones who harvest the field. That's left for later. And Jesus says that's going to be about the angels and the end of time. Things will get sorted out. Things will be made right, but that's not the job of the servants in the field. And there are still servants out in the field. And there are still fields, groups of people, <laughs> who 
where God's wheat needs food and water in the forms of prayer and love and solid teaching and encouragement to grow. But for relationships in the body of Christ, whether they are in sometimes easy and sometimes not, the servants are not called to be the ones who label the weeds and pull them out. Jesus instead gives a lot of instructions about forgiveness, about reconciliation, about healing, and about patience. There are times when he says evil, hurtful things are in, supposed to be confronted. There are even extreme times that Jesus talks about when he says to treat a person who is not willing to listen, not willing to improve after numerous attempts, he said then treat them as a Gentile or a tax collector, in other words, separate from them. But that is the last resort. That is at the end of the list after all the forgiveness and prayer and attempts to reconcile. You know, there is a hopefulness in trying to live in such a way that we refuse to consider someone to be a weed planted by the enemy. That we would have that hope that things can change, that relationships can improve, and that unity can come. That hope that someone we feared might be a weed would someday bear fruit for Jesus beyond our wildest dreams. And that they would someday be that person in the fellowship of believers who was so full of joy that they seemed like Ebenezer Scrooge on his first real Christmas morning. Maybe our hope needs to develop a toughness. I think the word that comes to my mind is that it might have a quality of fierceness. That we would fiercely keep believing that people can be wheat. That we would just determine, decide that we're going to be slow to judge. We're going to be quick to hope. We're going to be forgiving, and we're going to give second and third and fourth chances. Jesus says there is an enemy, but it will all get sorted out. And there is a plan for that. Some things, sometimes, we just have to wait and see. But while we do, we can dare to hope that people will prove to be wheat. And while we're hoping that, then we will act and we will pray and we will minister accordingly. Jesus died to make people new. All people. Every person. As Paul said, how could we see people in the same way we did before we experienced this change from Jesus in our own hearts? The first change that faith brought was in how we see Jesus. After that, hopefully, he changed how we see everyone else. We need to ask God to give us eyes that look at others with fierce hope. Would you pray with me? God, when we ask you in our hearts, it's that our hearts might change. But that's not just about bringing peace in our hearts. It needs to work itself out by changing the way we see everyone else. Help us to joyfully celebrate what you brought into our own lives. Help us to look hopefully for how abundantly you can do that in the lives of the people around us. Help us to be quick to forgive, slow to judge, and help us to fiercely hope for the best in everyone around us. And then we will pray and act accordingly, hopefully. Help us to do this, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. In Isaiah 44, 8, God said through the prophet, Do not tremble. Do not be afraid. Did I not proclaim my purposes for you long ago? You are my witnesses. There, is there any other God? No, there is no other rock, not one. May any fears this present time may put in your life fade before the assurance that God is desiring to work a good purpose in your life. May you know the peace that comes from a deep assurance 
that our God is the unique rock, the solid foundation, the only eternal one who would never abandon those he loves. May you know the depths of his peace this week in every aspect of your life.